Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome to our teaching. Thank you for coming. We're going to be presenting on uh, this topic, which is divest and decarcerate, where the climate movement and the prison abolition movement intersect. So we're going to start off with a few introductions. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Lexi. I go by she, her pronouns. I am Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Tiffany. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm on the policy team. Uh, hi, my name is Ronick. I go by they, them pronouns, and uh, I don't have a specific team I'm assigned to. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, um, you're free to drop them into the question box throughout the presentation, and if we have time at the end, we'll try to answer some of them. So before we get started, it's kind of important that we get familiar with a couple of core terms. Uh, one of these core terms is capital punishment, which is a synonym for the death penalty, which basically means it's in the execution of an offender sentenced to death after conviction by a court of law of a criminal offense. Second is what exactly is prison abolition? Prison abolition is a political vision with the goal of eliminating imprisonment, policing, and surveillance and creating lasting alternatives to punishment and imprisonment. Uh, but it's also a little bit more than that, which we'll elucidate on a little later. Uh, third is what exactly is decarceration? Decarceration is the opposite of incarceration, is the process of reducing the number of people imprisoned or the rate of imprisonment in a given jurisdiction. Uh, fourth is the prison industrial complex. This is probably one of the most important terms in prison abolition work. The prison industrial comp complex, also known as the PIC, uh, describes the overlapping interests of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. Uh, next is corporate migration. Uh, corporate migration is usually to avoid organized labor when corporations migrate in search of cheaper, exploitable labor. Uh, next is restorative justice. Restorative justice is a system of criminal justice which focuses on the rehabilitation of offenders through reconciliation with victims and the community at large. And finally is punitive justice, also known as retributive justice, a system of criminal justice based on the punishment of offenders rather than rehabilitation. Okay, this is part two of our glossary. Um, carceral capitalism is the vampiric nature of racial capitalist accumulation that feeds off and nourishes the carceral infrastructure of the US. Um, racial capitalism is a broader term that we use um, for the process of getting some sort of social or economic benefit from someone else's racial identity. The Green New Deal, which most of us probably know about, is a congressional resolution that lays out a plan for tackling climate change. Um, it envisions sourcing 100% of the country's electricity from renewable and zero emissions power, digit digitizing the nation's power grid, upgrading every building in the country to be more energy efficient and overhauling the transportation system by investing in electric vehicles and high speed, high speed rail. Um, it says that to address social justice, um, it's the duty of the government to provide job training and new economic development, particularly to communities that currently rely on jobs in fossil fuel industries. Um, excarceration is um, the step after decarceration. It's um, the process of diverting people away from situations that may bring them into contact with law enforcement and the prospect of prison. And finally, climate refugee is someone who's been forced to leave their home as a result of the effects of climate change on their environment. Want a society that centers freedom and justice instead of profit and punishment, spoken by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. So we're gonna start off with a bit of historical context to further our understanding of the prison abolition movement. So in 1790, the first ever prison is formed and during the revolution, imprisonment and forms of punitive justice were popularized. Um, in 1830 and to, all the way to 1870, the abolition movement emerges. Um, this is the slavery ab abolition movement to be clear. 
1852 onward, California opens its first prison, which is San Quentin. And after this, um, we see a huge spike in the growth of prisons. Um, after 1861, modern punishment practices like parole and probation are used more often. So in 1980, um, we see the prison abolition movement emerge. Um, it emerges after the war on drugs, which skyrocketed the number of people of color incarcerated. And particularly in California in the 80s, um, we saw a huge increase in prisons. We saw nine being opened between 1984 and 1989, where as we only opened a few prisons and facilities between the 1880s and 1970s. So it's like a whole century where we only built a few prisons and then all of a sudden we had nine and this only increased in the 90s and now there are huge numbers of prisons, camps, correctional facilities, mother facilities, etc. To continue that with historical context, in 1994, the three strikes law was approved in California, which meant that 20 years later, California had the highest number of incarcerated offenders with life sentences. So 20 years later, in 2011, California, like I said, had the largest state-run prison system, which included 33 state-run prisons, um, 1,000, sorry, <laughs> 145,000 offenders, and 3,200 juvenile offenders. So a couple years later, 2012, the laws begin to change, which included Proposition 36, 47, and the case Ashker versus the governor of California. And all of these aim to reform the incarceration system by reducing the amount of inmates. However, here in 2020, we still find the incarceration system is very problematic and this is an issue that we need to continue to fight, seeking ways to educate ourselves and others about the corrupt incarceration system and advocate for more effective ways of dispelling crime. So this is a quote from Angela Davis. Um, it is as if prison were an inevitable fact of life like birth and death. So the big question we are gonna start off with is why do we take the prison system for granted? Yeah, so one reason why we take the prison system for granted is because of the sort of media we're constantly consuming, which never accurately represents the prison system and state of imprisonment. The harsh realities of imprisonment are hidden from almost all who have not been imprisoned before. It is virtually impossible for someone to avoid consuming images of the prison, and almost always they are depicted inaccurately. They cause us to take, uh, take their exist uh, existence for granted. The institution has become a key ingredient of our common sense. Thus, we do not question its existence. Some historical context for the prison system can also help us understand why we take it for granted. In the 1700s, punishment usually came in the form of burning. We then turned to strangulation, then corporal punishment, and finally prisons. So it's ironic that we use the term prison reform, as with historical context, we can see that prison is the reform, which is part of why we take prisons for granted. Prisons have been, we moved from slave masters' houses to prisons. Prisons have become the reform and have naturalized ourselves in our imaginaries as the new status quo. As a consequence, we can observe the ideological influence of prisons. The prison system is treated as an abstract site into which undesirables are deposed, uh, deposited into so that we do not have to face the realities of the prison or take responsibility for our systemic issues. This out of sight, out of mind tactic results in both a mental and physical disconnect. It leads us to imagine an actual disconnect between prisons and society, between those incarcerated and ourselves. Moreover, the way that certain populaces of people, namely black or brown people, are already always demarcated as criminal, dirty, etc., creates a sense of paranoia for civilization that makes prison seem, prisons seem necessary. The trope of the unruly black and brown person wreaking havoc in civilization is then used to justify hypercarceral strategies that disproportionately target marginalized bodies. You should ask yourself, why was Amadou Diallo shot 41 times when he was unarmed? Why was Oscar Grant, when he was on the ground with his hands up, still shot in the back? Tropes of fear and criminality are ascribed onto bodies in an irrational manner to maintain fear. And that justifies our paranoia of, oh, the next serial killer, oh, the next rapist that we have to combat. 
So we're going to explore whether or not there really is a disconnect. Um, the short answer is no. The longer answer is yes, mentally there is a disconnect. However, the current punitive system and other institutions did not become an oppressive power structure by coincidence. And neither did the social economic conditions that go unaddressed by our current punitive justice system. So the rapid prisonization of the California landscape and other areas of the US has been described as a geographical solution to uh, social economic problems. Um, that basically means that the role of prisons is to be a quick fix to the conditions of low income communities. Um, we'll go more into depth with this later, but um, modern punitive methods have led to blurred lines when it comes to distinguishing between those in prison and those outside of prison. Um, one criminologist, Jonathan Simon, calls this governing through crime, which is basically for other institutions begin to internalize and mimic the practices and logistics of the prison system. So what exactly is the prison industrial complex? Well, it's a set of bureaucratic, political, and economic interests that encourage increased spending on imprisonment, regardless of the actual need. The term prison industrial complex is derived from the military industrial complex due to the similar connection between the institution and the supplier industry, which is a pretty frightening parallel if you think about it. The concept of the prison industrial complex was introduced by the scholars and activists to contest the prevailing beliefs that the rapid growth of the prison population could be attributed to a similar increase in crime, because that's not really the case. So what led to the development of the prison industrial complex? As we saw in the timeline of US prisons, the expansion of our prison system led to the expansion of the corporate involvement, which in turn led to capital for these supplier industries. Basically, these human people are being treated like supply and demand. As M. Davis writes, the prison prison trends, both increasing in of corporations, in the prison economy and the establishment of private prisons are reminiscent of the historical efforts to create a profitable punishment industry based on the new supply of free black male laborers in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, so here's a diagram of what the prison industrial complex could look like if we drew it all out. However, it is, known by, it, it is by no means limited to the prison related interests. In the 80s, corporate ties to the prison system were stronger than ever, with construction companies and hygiene companies and any company really investing in the prison system. These companies basically view prisoners as profit. You might be surprised to hear that the pharmaceutical industry was very involved in the prison industrial complex, especially after World War II. This is because a lot of medical experimentation was done on captive prisoners from the war, or from the war and the pharmaceutical companies were racing for greater market share. We can apply the same privatization patterns occurring within the prison industrial complex to other areas of our lives like healthcare and education. The problem is that the prison industrial complex is not limited to just one thing, but rather is an ideology that has spread throughout every aspect of our society, making it a dangerous assemblage. forget that those incarcerated or detained are the most vulnerable population when it comes to the economic crisis in a similar fashion as shown in the COVID-19 crisis. As record-breaking temperatures continue to heat up the outside world, the people who are kept inside cages of concrete and steel with no control over their own conditions and no ability to leave, they're powerless to escape its effects. The link between mass incarceration and environmental destruction is well established. We can see this in instances like prisoners in California having to fight wildfires without protective gear and no pet. Prisoners vulnerable to storm, storms and floods, like on the East Coast. Toxic cleanups and hurricane wreckage, lack of air conditioning and exceptionally hot fog, like Arizona, Texas, and Florida, where it's often over 100 degrees in the summer. Climate refugee families being detained and separated, and black, brown, and low-income prisoners held in toxic conditions. We can use this current pandemic as a reference for how brutally unprepared we are to prepare and to protect vulnerable populations like the incarcerated.
So all of this brings us to the term carceral capitalism. Um, it's not like an official term or anything, but it was introduced in Jackie Wang's essays, um, one of which is carceral capitalism. She characterizes this term as a newer contemporary form of racial capitalism. And to provide a bit of modern historical context, um, the 2008 financial crisis marked the beginning of this new era of racial capitalism, as there was a huge spike in predatory, uh, predatory loaning and parasitic governance. So in the past, um, as we saw in the timeline before, techniques of governan governance mostly involved physical confinement and the state sanctioned execution of Black Americans. But more recently, new carceral modes have blurred the distinction between the inside and outside of prison. We can see this in new technologies like for surveillance, as well as the government through crime concept we discussed earlier. So as we develop these technologies and keep modernizing these new surveillance methods, um, carcerality tends to bleed into society. So um, in addition, prisoners don't really receive many of the human rights that the unincarcerated do. This can include voting rights in all but two states, which is Maine and Vermont. Um, in 11 states, actually, felons lose their voting rights indefinitely until they get a pardon or do some kind of mandatory action. Um, they don't have access to quality or any health care and mental illness support. Um, they have no right to privacy, no protection from cruel and unusual punishment. There is no minimum wage requirements. And if we put this all into context with COVID-19, um, it can really show how unprepared we are. So while prisoners have uh, protected rights by the law, such as um, the Eighth Amend Amendment, these laws and rights are not always enforced in the prison system. It's part of the reason why we need a shift towards the prison abolition movement. Okay, so here is a layout of key differences between retributive justice and restorative justice. So in the model of retributive justice, crime is considered an act against the state or a violation of the law. The criminal justice system controls the crime. Offender accountability is defined as taking punishment and it's all under this belief that the punishment is effective with an emphasis on adverse relationships. However, in the restorative justice system, Crime is considered an act against another person or a community in a more personal sense. Crime control flies in the community and focuses on healing and re <laughs> rehab. Assumes that the person or people most affected by the crime, victims and offenders, we should all have the opportunity to become involved in resolving the conflict. It's focused on a healing and understanding process rather than completely punitive. Uh, so now we come to a portion that's all, that, is, that is of contentious debate in this literature base. It's the distinction between prison reform and prison abolition. Uh, for any like policy debaters for next year, huge shout out to y'all because you already know this is going to be like a huge part of our topic next year, uh, but let's just get into it. Uh, moving on to two different movements, both of which seek to improve the condition of those incarcerated. However, there's some differences to note. First, prison reform. Prison reform is focused on improving the current prison system. It believes that the prison slash policing tactics are redeemable tools to improve prison conditions worth, uh, via working within the system. Uh, things such as in giving prisoners access to health care, giving um, people incarcerated the ability to seek legal representation, things that work within to refine and change the ways of the, pr uh, uh, of the prison to make it more ethical or to make it something that, that we would not see as so bad or so vicious or so like so wedded to the logics of racialization that we talked about above. On the other hand, prison abolition is a lot more radical in its approach. The goal is to replace the current punitive system. It's not just limited to the prison system, it's also focused on addressing systemic issue, issues such as the juvie to prison pipeline, poor communities, etc. It's 
the argument that prison, uh, prison abolitionist movements would make is that the endless tinkering with prison systems is unable to actually reduce violence, but rather it shifts how violence operates. So an argument that a lot of abolitionist movements will, uh, will make, and also a lot of Afro-pessimists uh, pessimists will make, is this idea about the way that violence keeps shifting. Uh, there's a really, if you've read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, there's a really, really good, uh, important study she cites that says that right now we have more Black Americans incarcerated inside of prisons than we did during Jim Crow era, uh, Jim Crow era or slavery era itself which all seems to indicate that the way the, the narrative of progress has been constructed or the an endless focus on reform, reform, reform to make a more ethical construct does not do anything to solve the root cause of the problem, but rather just masks the way in which violence actually occurs, which means that we have an ethical obligation to risk it all in order to create a more ethical society for everyone else. It has become almost conventional wisdom that private prisons are the real problem with mass incarceration. Consider these statistics. 92% of the population, sorry, of the people locked inside American prisons are held in publicly run public prisons. 99% of those in jail are in public jail. So every private prison could close tomorrow. Not a single person would go home free. The idea that the private prisons are the culprit and that the profit is the motivation behind all these prisons have a firm grip on the popular imagination. Yes, the conversation has now shifted since the 80s. Some reforms have been really important and really helpful, like addressing the issues of sexual abuse and medical neglect in women's prisons. But debates and frameworks that rely solely on the topic of prison reform, seeking strategies for decarceration and ways to reduce population prison. And if prison reform isn't enough, then what is? So here's where we introduce um, the concept of prison abolition. So what exactly is prison abolition? Because I know it sounds scary to some people, it might not sound feasible to you. So maybe prison abolitionists are just hopeful idealists and utopians but maybe not. So here are the three pillars of prison abolition. The first is moratorium, which is seizing construction of new prisons. This means shutting them down, trying to um, lower the number of prisons. And that brings us to our next pillar, which is decarceration, finding ways to get people out of prison and lower the prison population. Um, the third pillar is excarceration, which is diverting people away from situations that may bring them into future contact with law enforcement and the prospect of prison. So abolition is not just shutting down or closing prisons. Um, it's about restoring vital systems of support that many communities lack. It's a theory of change. So um, take Oakland, for example. One organization, Critical Resistance, you might have heard, heard of it. Um, it was founded by prison abolitionists Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, it's worked in small communities to create um, communities that don't call the police and rehabilitate people in their own neighborhoods. The impact of this has been profound with actual crime rates plummeting and the overall success of those areas in socioeconomic terms. So I guess then we come to the sort of question of why is it so difficult for us to envision alternatives to the current prison system? Right, so like if I go to my dad and I ask, hey dad, what if you like said bye bye prisons? He would probably think that's like a ridiculous idea. And the reason for this is that is because we've been ingrained since our births about the necessity of punishment. Foucault's work, Discipline and Punishment, uh, uh, explains how we are constantly taught that for acts that we disagree with, we need to punish and discipline people to take control over their body. This is what we call biopolitics. This is indoctrinated a system of carcerality in our mind, as well as the real. Before we can formulate solutions for how to solve the concept of prisons and the reality, we need to move away from this desire for control in, and desire for biopolitics over biopolitical control over another person in the first place. What this argument basically breaks down to is two things. One, it says the reason why it's so difficult for us to envision an alternative future is the way we've been indoctrinated time and time again right, that we keep learning 
that we are the only way for us to achieve what we want and to achieve a safe society is punishment, punishment, punishment. It's like if I called you stupid every day of your life, you'd eventually come to internalize that for yourself. Rather, what an abolitionist narrative would rather do is rupture that repetitive framing and say, instead of that, we should think about new solutions and offer a momentary break in order for us to be able to think of those things. It's just to reformulate our ideas instead of punish, 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 to rehabilitate. How can we help you back in becoming a productive member of society so we can all be intertwined with one another as, as a society together? That brings us to the question of what is the first step? Angela Davis writes that the first step is to transform schools into vehicles for decarceration because the way that we are pedagogically indoctrinated shapes the ability for us to come up with alternatives in the first place. Before we can end the material embodiment of prisons, we must first remove the prison from our social and ideological landscapes. But on a material level, it's just starting in small, community, in small communities that do not rely on police and to rehabilitate instead of punish. This was the example that was given about Oakland and the critical resistance movements there that have proven to be more effective than police interaction and prison, and prison incarceration via just like in doing better community practices and refusing to call the police for things. draft of the Green New Deal, neglect to engage with decarceration, prison abol abolition, and demilitarization, as unfortunately it fails to recognize those incarcerated especially as especially vulnerable to the climate crisis. But the great thing about the Green New Deal is that it has the capacity for great change, as it is founded on the basis of positive, widespread, and systematic change. In order to achieve a future that is better and livable for everyone, we need to interweave both the climate movement and the prison abolition movements together. Because prison abolition and the Green New Deal is not just a movement against prisons and against global warming, but rather striving for that allows room for prisons and communities to be abolished, a society that is better for everyone. We have a world that has alternative to carbon pollution as well as prisons, because otherwise we fall back onto the same systems the same structures that allowed for these crises to arise in the first place. The effects of warming on the minority communities and prison communities get the background if we continue to separate these movements. Because status quo methods of challenging climate leave these marginalized communities in the background. The status quo mindset features a privileged lens that shifts the blame of the climate crisis to black and brown people without challenging the racialized effects of climate and acknowledging that these communities is not enough. So if we, if the current Green New Deal isn't enough, then what do we add to it? Or what would the decarceration version of the Green New Deal entail? So the first pillar would be to redefine public safety to include social and economic stability. Um, according to one sociolo sociologist called um, Bruce Western, when mass incarceration accelerated in the late 80s and 90s, about a third of those incarcerated were unemployed. So in a sense, mass incarceration serves as like a labor market institution. Um, much of what, like what we discussed earlier, how the prison system is a geographical response to socioeconomic problems. This trend in the 80s and 90s shows that mass incarceration is a racialized response to high unemployment rates. Um, rather than addressing this issue with job guarantees, the U.S. turned to prisons as an outlet for the surplus of labor. Um, the purpose of mass incarceration is to fracture and discipline the working class, while at the same time artificially decreasing unemployment rates. Today, the unemployment rate uh, among incarcerated people before they were put in prisons is 27%. So this is why we need a jobs guarantee, a guarantee for everyone, not one that's just means testing. And in addition, as Angela Davis has said, we need to redirect the funding from prisons and policing to infrastructures like public education and prioritize um, addressing the socioeconomic issues present in low income communities. So like the government by crime phenomenon we mentioned earlier, where other public institutions are mimicking the logistics of prisons, 
we're seeing an influx of cops in schools um, leading to an increase in school arrests. Um, that's like 300 to 500 percent increase in um, school-based arrests since the 90s and making it much more likely for kids to end up in juvie and miss out on higher education and job opportunities. And then on top of that, people of color and LGBT people have been arrested at disproportionate rates. And then the third part of this first pillar would be um, housing. Uh, currently, obviously, housing policy is climate policy as the Green New Deal, the current Green New Deal entails. And we can apply that same mindset to um, criminal justice policy. So right now, landlords are able to exclude people um, with criminal records from their buildings. And in some cases, families get separated in the process as public housing authorities are able to exclude the families of people with criminal records from certain areas of public housing. empower care workers and disempower the law enforcing platform. We have to work to replace the recent militaries, militarized policing with the current status quo. By doing so and increasing uncertainty and reducing the surveillance power, that's the bare minimum. We need to redirect the resources going into the police system to public health and public education. We need to create an atmosphere of understanding rehabilitation in the place of strict and generic punishment. Investing those things listed above, housing, healthcare, education, jobs for all, as well as empowering care workers who are trained to de-escalate situations and give mental health services would lead to a redefinition of public safety. We'll see situations like women easily accessing safe and affordable healthcare and housing and being less likely to stay in dangerous situations of domestic abuse as well as social workers providing rides to social services instead of escalating the conflict. Uh, and I guess the final thing we'll talk about is how we need to end both carbon and carcel dependence. Uh, as we sort of elucidated to her earlier, uh, there's a growing connection between the environmental problem as well as the carceral problem. that are interwoven and dependent upon each other. What we need is a dual power approach that approaches from both sides in order to challenge the system. It's no longer enough for us to say, hey, we can retool carbon or hey, we can retool prisons because each time we have retooled those things, it resulted in an exacerbation of the situation and just hiding the way that those sort of balance operates. Instead, it's time for us to throw the entire system up in the air and it's time to embrace a new method. The final pair to end both carbon and carceral dependence would create a transition in not just restorative justice between individuals, but a structural restorative justice among people, institutions, and society. It's time to change the way the system functions so the system can function for everyone. So here are some other resources we have linked and listed. Um, if you want, we can send you these slides. I don't know how helpful they would be, but they do have these links. So um, if you want the slides, I guess, uh, just drop your email in the chat to like all panelists, not like all panelists and attendees, just like all panelists. And then, um, Ronik, do you want to talk a bit about the stuff you linked? Yeah, so uh, the three YouTube videos I linked are a discussion between two abolitionists, namely Chad Gossett and Dean Spade, who are who are like really, really well known in academia for writing about abolitionist work. Uh, they have created a three part, like seven minute YouTube series that uh, that basically just answers your basic questions about abolitionism, i.e. what's the alternative, i.e. what do about the other criminals that I think if you're interested in these types of things or you're still a little bit confused, will provide a lot of clarity for. Okay, so um, do you want to go to the, is there another slide after this? Yeah, so here are some organizations to check out. Um, Critical Resistance is probably like the organized, like the foundation, I guess. Um, 
the people we quoted, Angela Davis and uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, they uh, were the co-founders of this organization and they've done a lot of great work in Oakland, Portland, NYC, and LA, I think. Um, other one is Curve, then uh, do you wanna talk about the ones you listed? Yeah, uh, so then there's street transvestite action revolutionaries. Uh, these people were more in the line of like Stonewall abolition movement that have continued to grow, creating communities of care uh, for transvestite individuals who are on the streets and do not have a place to go. Uh, the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is an abolitionist movement that's uh, trying to create the same sort of communities that the Underground Railroad did in the old abolition movement. And finally, Mary Nardini Gang is a group of individual, a group of queer individuals who have coalesced under a name calling themselves a gang that fight for radical abolitionist movement. Uh, here are some of our sources. And um, yeah, so someone <laughs> asked, what was the YouTube channel you were talking about earlier? Yeah, so the YouTube channel, uh, I don't know the specific name of the channel, uh, but the video series is like, if you search up uh, uh, Chad Gossett and Dean Spade, uh, I can like type uh, Dean Spade. If you search up Dean Spade and abolitionism, it should pop up in like the first YouTube videos. It's a three part series. It's phenomenal to watch and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so yeah, Dean Spade and abolitionism, it should be the first result that pops up. It's, and it's an interview with Chad Gossett, if that'll help. Um, we got another question that says, what can we as individuals do to help support the prison abolition movement? Helen, you have some thought, or Tiffany, you have some thought? Um, I would say, um, if you're like, if you are new to the movement or like you don't know that much um, other than this presentation, I would definitely say like check out the resources um, that we listed in other texts um, and like try to educate yourself and um, I guess learn more. I would definitely read Angela Davis or any like articles written by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, those two are kind of icons. And for those who are already like familiar with the movement, um, I guess you can like get involved in an organization in one of those like grassroots movements. And I think Ronick, Ronick, you know more about that. So. Uh, am I muted? No, no, okay. Uh, so I guess a couple of things uh, I would add. Uh, first is uh, Critical Resistance Oakland. Uh, they have like methods for you to organize. If you just go to their website, they're really great there. Uh, send an email out to your organize uh, to your local organizer in Oakland, uh, Portland, etc. Uh, secondly, is that they have a store for like selling merchandise. That's super duper important because it allows for them to fund their operations uh, that are being able to help. So even if you can't physically be there, especially during the time of coronavirus, it's super important that we uh, continue to help fund these abolition movements that aren't uh, funded, obviously, uh, by big corporations. And uh, I think lastly is, um, is like get involved, right? Most of the stuff that does, like a lot of the abolition movements that are being created in the status quo are not like, you know, something that have a definite name, right? There's something that we've created there's something that happened on our micro levels that maybe not everyone knows about. It's about starting from the grassroots and helping educate people. Uh, there's this one person I really love. His name was, uh, he's uh, famous on TikTok and was an ex-debater, the consciously. He says, education is elevation. What this means is that the more we're able to spread awareness about things and allow for other people to help challenge the way the punishment has been made our normative pedagogical um, ideas, is the only way for us to be able to create an effective movement against prisons in the long run. But yeah, that's just my two cents. Thank you, Ronick. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, just, okay, yeah, can you drop the TikTok at? Thanks, Alice. <laughs> So if you guys have any other questions, you can drop them in. Otherwise, we're probably going to be ending early. Um, OK. So yeah, so will the presentation be made available anywhere? Yeah, just like drop your email in the chat to all panelists, and we'll send it to you.
Yeah. So, Helen, that's an interesting question. Next steps besides education. I honestly think that the next step besides education is to allow for others to have the opportunity to educate themselves, right? Because the problem is that, like, I was, there's this Joy James lecture, again, for people on YouTube, if you have free time, search up Joy James, the architects of abolition. It's a great move. It's a great, like, uh, thing for you to watch. And she, her argument is for incarcerated people within prisons themselves, uh, the problem is that when they are trying to, you know, like read up on these abolitionist movements and things that they can do to get involved, to break down the system. The problem is that like police and, and police people inside of the jail cells are like, no, you can't do that. And they put them in solitary confinement, right? Because then they're isolated and then they're not educated. And then they're unable to gain access to those things in the first place. So by education, I don't mean like just ourselves, you know, hey, we need to learn more about the movement, but education by, I mean, we need to be able to uh, to allow for those also on the inside to help get access to the education that they want, right? People need to be access to uh, people need access to the materials in the first place in order to start the movement. Um, other countries or areas in the world that have abolished prison systems. Um, I don't know if they're countries, but I know that uh, in some communities, uh, for example. Uh, I was reading about some a while back. They're like small, like local communities that have abolished prisons and refused to call the police, but there's no countries or nations that don't have the police or uh, stuff like that. Um, so Helen, there's a couple of things you can do. First is like, again, critical resistance. They obviously have a great m mechanism for you to like uh, help those on the inside. Second is like letter writing campaigns are huge for them because you're, you're breaking down the mode of social isolation that prisons attempt to construct. And third is like, uh, just like advocacy, right? To allow for, the, to like, you're able to go through and talk to prisoners and go into, the, uh, and go into jails, uh, like not go into jail cells, but you're allowed to go and talk to people, right? And I think that's the problem with the current movement, right? that we do not know enough about the inside and we're sitting here in our ivory tower of academics. The thing that we need to do the most is like go there and talk. Yeah, um, and I'm not part of the presentation. I'm just doing tech, but I think that that's super important um, and I don't know a lot about this. So thanks for bringing that up. But I also feel like talking to people on the inside kind of like breaks down that invisible barrier that like our current system has created between us and prisoners because at the end of the day like there is no I mean technically there is a societal barrier but we can always go and educate those people that is always something that is available to us. Yeah and prison as we covered in the presentation it's not just limited to like you know like the iron bars physical um, confinement but it can also be like mass surveillance new technologies and policing. So like, I guess, um, movements against those kind of developments and like uh, advocating for against those um, kind of technologies of mass surveillance and like other um, violations of privacy, that would also be a good step. Um, Helen, if I'm getting your question correct, is this like, what do we do in the case of like rapists and serial killers? Question mark? Oh, oh, like what about prisons for like rich white men? Oh, interesting. Uh, so this is what I've been thinking about a lot, right? I just, uh, I just finished reading like a book called, hmm. Uh, what was the book called? It was one of, uh, Dark Sue Surveillance by Simone Brown. And it's like very, very good at getting the question of why we need counter strategies towards that, right? The, the back to the, the decent claim that Simone Brown makes is that like, A, we can utilize surveillance against these people, right? Uh, against the same folks. 
but it also says that overwhelmingly prisons do not help deter these things from occurring, right? Uh, the Che Gossett interview that I suggested does a really, really articulate rephrasing of it. It says it's not so much these isolated instances or these superhero vict or these superhero criminals that we call them uh, are the ones that are the majority of cases, but rather it's the prisons that are the rapists, it's the prisons that are the serial killers, it's the prisons that enact the sort of violence on a much greater scale. Instead, we need to create a different mode of like communicating and rehabilitating and like forcing people to like understand that things are wrong. Uh, this is like where my research is like primarily at right now. I'm trying to find focus on like what are the alternatives to these extra cases. But like to be honest, like yes, these things are bad, right? The Harvey Weinsteins of the world and these rich white men that do like a bunch of bad stuff are bad. But the way that hate, but like prisons are just net worse, right? There is no downside. Most like rich white people get away with those things. There's very rare instances in which they're actually able to solve it and the risk of a benefit as outweighed by the harm. But then again, that kind of gets back to the question, right, uh, that we were talking about earlier about, you know, we need to uh, abolish our ideology and, nece and necessity of, uh, we need to abolish our ideology and necessity of prisons in the first place in order to come up with a solution to these things, in order to come up with a solution to these things. I just think that we really have to address the conditions that created the mindset for the person that enacts these crimes, because psychologically speaking, no mentally healthy person has the urge or even the capacity to go out and kill somebody else or do horrible, horrible things in some cases. And so those are fostered through terrible home situations like childhood, traumatic past, or just other psychological factors that can or cannot be controlled. And so putting those people in a situation that is risky, that is absolutely dangerous, and is not mentally healthy, so to speak, just exacerbates those and creates, honestly, a higher risk of them repeating those same crimes. Um, there was a new question that just came through. It was, uh, any good ways to keep up, uh, any good ways to keep up with news and updates about ongoing policy making regarding prisons. Um, this is like a really, 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 really tough thing to answer. Uh, just because like, if you go back to the thesis that we made in the beginning about the prison industrial complex, right? Uh, it's that the prison industrial complex has obfuscated the nature of prisons, right? So there's no one easy way for us to be like, hey, here's how we learn more about prisons but we have to do the active work of searching it up and like learning about it, right? So it, it would literally require us to go, hey, uh, re like create a Feedly and that's, or like one of those RSS feeds that are like, give me the daily news about criminal justice reform or give me the daily news about prisons or give me things about that. Uh, the New York Times has a lot of good stuff. And there's also like movements themselves are the best way to learn about things right, movements and talking to the people themselves, those are primary sources that are able to give you the most articulate explanation of what is needed right now and how to create a better tomorrow. Yeah, so Helen, the, uh, the killing slash violence stuff, uh, I mean, the rapist stuff in general, it's like, I, this sounds atrocious to say, but it's like how we have to frame it. It's that's inevitable in the status quo. Like that's already happening. Prisons exacerbate those things because the people in prisons are being raped at substantially larger rates and even greater experiences. And our argument is that then we need to find a new way to reform those things and mitigate those things. Uh, it's like what the person in the chat just said now. We need to find a way to break down systems of capital as well as prisons that create these things in the first place. Fred Moten says, uh, Fred Moten, another person you guys should definitely read, uh, says that we need to create haptic, re haptic relations of care with one another. That only when 
we can break down systems of capital and governance and prisons? Are we able to create a form of radical love for one another that gets rid of violence that happens in the first place, right? It's realizing that I am indebted for you just because you are indebted to me and because we are all humans, right? It, it, there's no external thing that we're in debt to. So power hierarchies are the root cause of the problem and it's a reason why we need to sort of abolish prisons in the first place. Yeah, and just adding on top of what Ronick already said, um, I think like right now when you think prison abolition, you're like, okay, that's just taking away all the prisons and what do we replace them with? But prison abolition isn't just abolishing prisons, it's abolishing capitalism, um, imperialism, like all these things are intertwined and because they all happen because of each other and you you can't just physically take away um, prisons and call that prison abolition. So yeah, um, what Heldon said in the chat, um, that was true. So right now, like the prisons, they are built off of capitalism, as we mentioned in like the historical context and everything we've seen so far. So abolishing prison wouldn't just be like closing them down. It would be um, like Ronick said, abolishing all of the factors in our society that contribute to um uh like the horrors that prisons create and, and that includes capitalism and i also think that like it's really interesting about how debates over abolitionism always get down to these what if scenarios of these one isolated instances of violence if you look to like the oakland study that tiffany was explaining about right it explained to you how we saw crime rates decrease we literally saw things, we saw crime rates decrease. We saw a decrease in sort of that sort of violence and rapists that were occurring in, this, in that situation, which all seems to indicate that in a world of where we shift away from police and a shift away from uh, prisons, we are able to cultivate more spiritual love for one another. It's able to challenge the reasons why those things occur in the first place. 